this is the equation um, for the Saniac effect. Now, this is represented in terms of length. Can you can you zoom in a little bit so that it's bigger, just so we can see it? Just like Control Z or yeah. Yeah. Control Mouse Wheel. I mean, bigger, like more, even, more. even more. Control Plus, more, bigger. more, more. Keep going. We'll Keep going. Stop. Yep. <laughs> yep. More. A little more. <laughs> and Let's bring it right to the maximum. That's right decent. That's decent. Dece. Dece. All right. So this is the equation for the Sagnac effect. You've got delta phi, which is the change in the fringes. It's the fringe shift, right? Um, but this is the equation. I've, I've got the legend right here. So delta phi equals the fringe displacement. L equals the path length of the light in the interferometer. V is the velocity of whatever's moving, in this case, the table. And then 4 pi, that's the geometric factor for a closed loop, right? Because um, there's a pi relationship in circles. Now, we can express that equation in terms of rotation. So V becomes omega because it's a rotational velocity. And then the pi L, kind of the same thing as pi diameter, right? Area of a circle, right? Um, where pi is the, or A is the area. Um, but it ends up being this equation right here for a rotating table. Delta phi equals 4 omega A over C lambda. Now, the V, or omega, and the L, or the area, they cannot both change simultaneously due to the rotation of the table because the way that V is calculated, right, is literally just velocity equals distance over time. And that's of the, you know, the table itself or the, the you know, rim of the table, whatever the part of the table you're measuring from. Um, L is the actual length of the loop upon the table through which, you know, the light is, is traveling. Now, during the debate, McToon wanted to tell you that the path length change was obviously the answer, you know, invoking absolute space, not realizing he was doing it. Didn't realize he wasn't explaining it relativistically at all. But the truth is, is if a change in the path length in L is invoked as an explanatory mechanism, then as the path length shortens, right, you're, it, there's whatever distance change that you invoke for the path length of the L is a proportional distance change of the distance used to calculate the V, right? They're going to be one for one with each other. So this is going to result in these two changes canceling each other out and end up giving you the same result as if the table was stationary. Um, it's also, um, since we measure the frequency of the light, you know, directly, and we can, you know, see that the frequency that we sent out is the same frequency that we get back, then we know that the frequency and wavelength, which are commensurately linked, are also remaining constant. Now, it's, a, it's of note that the equation does successfully predict the number of fringes that will be produced, and it does so based upon the variable V. This is the variable that is changed in order to account for how many fringes will be produced. I can say if I rotate this table at 10 meters a second, I should expect this many fringes, and it works. Um, but this is completely separate from any path length change because the same L is used at all times in the calculation. You do not change this variable. Um, that violates the Einsteinian postulate that the propagation rate of light will always be independent of the velocity of the source. And they have to claim that, right? Like that claim is a necessary claim in order to be able to keep C a universal constant. But as we observe in the Sagnac effect, the velocity of the source indeed does directly affect the wave propagation rate of the light, just like it does with all other waves. Observer. Well, yeah, the source, the observer, yeah. No, it's, it's Both. distinct. No, distinctly different. Never from the source, only from the observer. Hmm. I can see the observer, but why not the source? It just it doesn't for anything. Well, wouldn't the velocity be like with respect from the source to the observer? So it would be either way. Hmm. So the way that yeah, they did, you know, I'm on, I've been wondering the same thing, man. 
the way that they would do it, right, is it's relative to the person taking the measurement. So yeah. if that's the only thing that changes it, right? If the but person like, measuring it is moving. If, if the, the source, source is moving, was... it still comes out at the same rate. So, so wait, if the observer is stationary and the source is moving, it's not equivalent to if the source was stationary and the observer was moving? Correct. That's it, that's even in the postulates for it. So it's independent of the motion of the source or observer or an inertial observer. But is it not is the like the table is the source is it not the source that's moving? Yeah, but that's not it doesn't matter. So otherwise there would be like a double effect, right? Mm. So the source and the observer because the observer is the detector on the table. The where the light way where it recombines and like you know produces the fringe that's the observer, right, right. But that's that like the the point is though is he's talking about how like the path length is changing but the source the source and the recombiner are moving uniformly upon the same reference frame, and the reference frame of the table, um, because uniform motion would be treated as an inertial frame. So if if light was propagating through a vacuum, then there shouldn't be anything to to uh, affect it because as it's propagating, like the source is moving forwards as well. I mean, am I missing something here? Like that's what I'm trying to yeah, clarify. Yeah, the, yeah, the moving source of the like what's whatever's emitting it doesn't add any momentum to that. Right, it shouldn't like that. Right. So, but if there's a the, medium, then it would be dragging. Well, it doesn't matter either. The only thing that's going to change is if the guy that's recording, that's making the measurement, if, if he's moving, that's what's going to produce the, the variance, right? The C is C with respect to its inertial frame. It's observers moving that measure it differently. But they say, no, no, no. Uh, it measures the same for moving observers as long as they're in uniform motion. But that's obviously not true, right? Because that's, I mean, sound waves disprove that. Like, it's, it's well, right. literally the same concept, so... It's not yeah, the, the boats moving towards the lighthouse emitter, the observer on the boat. Yeah. Right. I mean, technically you're talking about like you're talking about the zero point of acceleration to the like to the beginning of acceleration. You're talking about that moment in time. And so uh, I mean it seems like it should be relevant. Well the GPS like, the, the GPS satellites really. The GPS satellites are both sources and emitters simultaneously because they all talk to each other. Well, I guess well, acceleration is not the right word to be induction, but. Well, they're sending, well, so even though the satellite's in motion, PZO, it's sending a snapshot of when it sends the signal and the motion of the receiver is what determines the, the measurement for the variance, right? It doesn't, doesn't put the satellite's velocity in there or like make any reductions or anything like that, right? But if the receiver's on the ground, the velocity that's being accounted for is the is the satellite's velocity. So are they treating the satellite's velocity as the ground's velocity? No, they're no. That's not not what's being accounted for at all. Because it accounts for its. I thought it was accounting for its own velocity, like the satellite. Oh, in the clock corrections to maintain uh, GPS yeah. time, but that's not sending signals out to a receiver. That's not. That's not saying that it's also accounting for its velocity with respect to the receiver like that. I, well, I thought that that's how they determine what the onboard time is, and they're literally correcting for the time because the time is what's changing because of the clock change. No, they're correcting for velocity with respect to absolute space, and then the signals sent out are just snapshots of that cohesive timeline. And then when the signal gets received, the difference is you know calculated on the receiver end, and the variance is measured with their or proportional to their velocity. Right, it doesn't have anything yeah. to do with with the correction that the that the clock is making to maintain GPS time. Well, but yeah, but how does the GPS satellite know what time it is when it takes the snapshot? It gets the time from the clock, right? That's what creates the desync. I thought. Like I thought that was specifically what creates the difference in time. Uh, from you know GPS satellite to receiver source is the fact that because the GPS satellite is moving, its velocity is causing the atomic clock to process forward, and that's causing a change in the time, which it gets captured in the snapshot. So, to have like the geometrically convenient position between them or whatever to like do the Lorentz transformation stuff, like yeah, you you would look at it like that for time dilation and stuff, right? But that's actually, but they don't even do that. 
right? It's all wrapped up in a sagnet correction in the first place. So it's not, it's literally only happening on one end. It's only happening on the receiver end. Yep. So, so like, so GPS, right? The satellite is just, a, it's just a cohesive timeline, right? And then it's just signaling out signals based off of that cohesive timeline. So, oh, wait a second. So you're telling me that when it sends the snapshot, it captures the onboard time, but also inside that data packet, it says that, hey, this was my velocity when I sent this packet. And when the receiver receives it, it says, okay, here's the time it, it gave me, but I'm going to adjust the time based on what it said its velocity was, and here's the corrected time. No, you keep adding velocity back in there for some reason. Explicitly not that. It's just sending out the time and its location in the coordinate system that it's, that it's at, right? Because So you know how they have their ECF, or I'm sorry, ECI, so they're like, okay, I'm at this location and it's this time down to the, you know, billionth, billionth of a second. And according to the onboard clock. Right. And it doesn't have anything to do with how fast the craft is moving. The whole time dilation correction stuff is just like a role play for them to talk about the distance or um, to talk about like a, a disparity between them, you know, in relativistic confines. But that's not even, they, they don't even do the wrench transformations in GPS. Well, I know, I know. It's this, I'm talking about the Sanya correction, bro. Yeah, I know, but well, that, Yo, that's, real quick. that's explicitly it, though. It doesn't. Can you guys, can mm -hmm. I request retweets of that so people know that the debate that's supposed to start right now is canceled? Um, yeah, so. So know, hold on a second. So the Sagnac, so that they, they're only accounting for the Sagnac effect of the, like, it, it's only applying to. The clock retardation to maintain GPS time. That's a separate issue from the calculations to derive distance based off of C that they're sending out, right? The range measurement equation. So it's like two it separate two separate issues. One is maintaining GPS time so that there can be a cohesive timeline for them to reference. And then the second is the signal that's sent out encodes the location of when it was sent and then that time. That's all but it needs. So, so it's got the location of the GPS, uh, which is calculated based on you know where it knows compared to where it, where it is compared to where it was. But then the time is calculated by the onboard clock. But the way that it knows that the time on the onboard clock is different from the time at the receiver is because they are able to account for the velocity. That's how they that's how they correct the time difference, isn't it? The Sanyak correction is accounting for the velocity of the clock, which causes the frequency shift, which causes the precession. Yeah. Okay, so I guess I don't understand this like I thought I did. I, I'm so confused now. So, the before you get before you think about the signals being sent out for the receivers, right? Just think about maintaining GPS time and what the crafts are doing, right? On so, board before it talks to anything else. Yep. Yeah, so as the as the satellite's moving. It's losing time, right? So with respect to itself, right? It's accounting for its own velocity. So within the, the own apparatus to maintain that 9.192 gigahertz frequency, it has to make corrections to, to make that timeline whole, right? Now, once that timeline's whole, it starts sending out signals based off of, you know, pulses with respect to that timeline where it's like, um, you know, fractions of a second are encoded into that, right? So it's sending out signals that it's like, hey, at this time, I was at this location, right? Mm -hmm. And those signals that get sent out, and then a ground receiver gets it. And it's like, how long did it take from this location for the signal to be sent? Now, they don't, there's no velocity corrections in there from the craft or anything like that. It's based purely off line of sight signals sent from the craft to the observer and that's it. So it's just the distance from that snapshot. And it's using C. Mm -hmm. Okay, where's the plus V come in? Well, in the range measurement equation, it doesn't. So the, on, the C plus or minus V is only on board the satellite. Mm, it, so the range measurement equation measures the, the variance, but it's not like a C plus or minus V like explicitly, right? Like it, The time difference in there isn't reflected in like a plus or minus situation, right? But that plus or minus is separate from the plus or minus of the time clock on the on board, right? It's two separate issues. So they're doing two Sanyak corrections. Correct. You have to you have to make Sanyak corrections for the craft to keep time synced, and then on once board. You, yes, and then once you have a cohesive timeline, 
to start broadcasting signals based off of that timeline. So the actual measurements to determine distance are based off of that broadcast, which has the time broken down into fractions of seconds and the location. Where's the second Sanyak correction performed? Second Sanyak correct. So that would be on the receiver end. And which which velocity is being accounted for in that second Sanyak correction? So that's where they get into the quote unquote Lorentz rotation, and that's where they just rotate the coordinate system. A co- proportional to what? Not sure. You'd have to ask Eric. It's just a inversion, and if they don't do it, they're off by thirty meters to the east. I think. Okay. So I was. I thought that the correction that they added in that fixed it was the correction for the atomic clock because it was desyncing on board and processing on board, and so they added that on board correction. That's what fixed it. So they they had well, to do two corrections. Well, that's just to keep the GPS time cohesive. Right, right but who discovered that we have to account for the velocity of the satellite relative to itself? Uh, right, that that was- so in the 80s, there was an experiment by a guy named something Subaru or Subarai, something like that. And it was where they were taking clocks up and down the East Coast, and then they took one to Tokyo or something like that. And the difference between them is like where they figured out that Einstein, Einsteinian clock synchronization really wasn't working out. So it was, it was around then. Like, I'm not sure who the specific lad was that put the equation in there to solve it, but that experiment was pivotal in showing that Einsteinian clock synchronization wasn't, wasn't real. Okay. So I guess I understand the onboard part. I guess where my confusion lies is on the receiver end Mm -hmm. because they're, the 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 time the onboard time has already been locally corrected like right it's proportional to you know the velocity of the craft on board that's how they know the rate of that's how they know like by what rate the the desync is happening on board like it should be 9.192 but it's actually like 9.193 because we're moving this fast right whatever okay Whoa. now now we've corrected it before we send it out so pre prior to sending it out we do an onboard correction then we send it out the the corrected local time onboard time is captured in that packet. It's sent to the receiver. The receiver gets it. So then, what's the second correction for? The rotation. They, oh, I'm sorry. The the Lorentz rotation. What is the Lorentz rotation capturing though? Well, nothing. That's the thing, right? Because the range measurement equation already accounts for the Sagnac effect in it because it's a time interval system, you know, and it's just taking the disparity between the time of when the signal was sent and when it was received. So it's already accounted for in it. So the, any secondary corrections that they do after the fact are, you know, who knows what the hell they're doing, right? Oh, so you're saying, you're saying we've got the, we've captured, we've captured the onboard time when it's sent. We've captured the reception time when it's received. We already know the distance between the two points because the coordinate system, but there's a time disparity. It, it shouldn't, it should have like got here slightly sooner or slightly later than, than well, what the, it did. Well, the time disparity gives them the, the accurate distance for any coordinate system, right? Because it's supposed to be based on the constancy of C. But once they have that distance, they could put it on any coordinate system. But when they put it on the Earth, right, they have to make an additional correction where they do their Lorentz rotation, which is like a whole separate issue because if C were C, they wouldn't have to make any corrections like that. Yeah, because they, because we don't... They, go ahead. We don't know the magnitude of the Lorentz rotation correction. Uh, we can get it. Uh, Eric knows it. And he Who's was Eric. Uh, he comes in here, Eric E. Our oh. satellite lad. He's very familiar okay. with it. Okay. So I, I mean, I can see why the onboard atomic clock correction shouldn't be happening because that means that the satellite without referencing any outside coordinate system, just the atomic clock itself in this encapsulated little box is accounting for its own velocity, absolute velocity through space. Uh, But I don't really know what's happening with the Lorentz rotation correction yet. Yeah, so it's not even like a relativistic correction or a sagnet correction. It's like a separate thing because, like I said, it's just you know how they do their world line and their 
spatial axis. So they're just inverting the world line in the X axis. And that gives, and, and that gives the, and that puts them on target. If they don't do that, they're off by 30 meters. I would presume that they would have to account for like the gradient that they're passing through all the layers of, of changing velocity vertically as oh, well. No, not at all. So C, C propagates at like 0.999 C at, you know, with satellites or whatever. So it's, there's no, it's not even a factor. Oh, well, I mean, it doesn't change it. Cause like dude was talking, what was his face? Uh, Ron Hatch was talking about a 32 nanosecond difference between San Francisco and New York, A to B like Marmet. Oh, Marmet. Okay. My bad. Or Marmet. Marmet. I don't know. One of those French lads, Marmet or Marmet. Yeah. So like <laughs> 32 seconds difference respectively to, from like source to receiver or receiver back to source, right? Like A to B or B back to A. Source and they're to capturing. Receiver. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But if, if it's not the onboard correction that is fixing that, and it's the ground receiver correction that's fixing that. What is the ground receiver doing to ch to account for the 32 nanoseconds? Like, if it's not a velocity component, right? Like, what is it? Like, because you can't you can't invoke a path length change because the receiver is stationary. It's right. It's, it's giving them their accurate distance. But the time's changing. No. The time when the signal was sent doesn't change. And then it gets, no, 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 but... and then it gets received, right? And it's expected to be received at a rate of C. But what they find is that it's like, you know, either plus or minus a little bit. Right. But the plus or minus little bit is not V of the satellite, is what you're saying. Correct. Okay, it's some other V. Correct. Okay. Okay, that's what I'm trying to figure out is what that V is. Oh, it's the ether wind. That's what, or you know, if they're not if they're not moving right, then there is a drift or whatever, right? They call it Earth rotation, but that's just the ether wind relative to the laddy. Okay. And then if they're moving, right, then that gets then their velocity gets in there proportional, but that comes from their velocity, not the, not not the. Uh, if the receiver's moving. Yeah, yeah. If the receiver is moving, it doesn't matter if the sun. Yeah, because the sin the signal sent out as a as a pulse at a point point in time. Yep. Yeah, it's the receiver. Okay, okay. But do they represent the receiver movement? Do they try to like claim a path length change? No, no. They say the speed of light is the same, and you're retarded. Because because <laughs> I feel like the path length. Yeah, I feel like the path length change like creates the whole like linear displacement problem. So there's no, uh, so the range measurement equation, right? There's no path link change. It's just counting time sent to time received. And then it's like, what's the ratio against C essentially? Oh, uh, okay. Even though it's not multiplying it instead of fighting it, but same concept. So, so why? Hmm. Why would they not be able to do a point to point path length change? Would they um, not be able to do a point to point path length change to, account, to, to account for the slight deviation? Like re emitter to receiver, like during the time of flight, there was a slight motion of the receiver over here, which resulted in the path length change. Oh, you mean like did the earth rotate out from under them or whatever? Or not even necessarily the Earth rotate up from under them, like the satellite that was originally at this point when it was sent is now at this point when it's received. I mean, I don't. It doesn't matter where the satellite's at when the receiver gets it, though. That's irrelevant. It doesn't. Um... Oh, because it's only calculated at one point in time. Like yeah. this is where I was it, when I received it. Yeah, it just sends like it's just done off single trilateration, right? So it's just. Once when you get one signal from a craft, you get another signal, yeah. and you get another signal. It's not like, hey, I sent the signal that's here, true. and then I sent another one back, and now I'm at. The, it's not doing that. That's I guess that's true. Um, well, okay, okay. 
that would mean that technically, yeah, okay. So that would mean technically if they were to do the A to B and B to A, but they were to time it in such a way that they knew that like at reception time, the distance actually ended up being equal, they'd still have a time difference because of the drift. And that's what they're actually correcting for. Because directionality produces a slightly different velocity ratio to C. Yes. Okay. I'm just wondering, like, in Marmat's paper, does he explicitly prove that it's a drift effect? Like, what is he know? Oh, I mean, he denotes. No, 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 they don't drift anything in globularity land. They they Earth rotate. Yeah, but I mean, I'm I'm thinking about that, right? Like, we know that the drift is faster up at altitude. So I oh, feel like if they. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I see what you're saying. So Bennett has some has some things on that that he's going to be talking about for his ether presentation, but I do, I don't understand uh, what he's putting forward for it. Cause, Cause the factor, like whatever factor that they use that they multiply by at the ground, like let's say that they're at the equator at ground level. So it should be 15 degrees per hour or whatever. Mm. If they use that 15 degrees per hour, except they use it uh, as if it was, you know, ground speed. Cause, cause right, no matter right. how high you go, it has to be the same the actual signal deviation would be slightly different than that because mm. emitting from way up in the air to the ground goes through like a bunch of different velocity layers. So they would actually be off by like X many nanoseconds. No, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. So that's probably the meridian corrections would probably aid in that. Right. Because they are, they have their, like they, you know, they say that the satellites are X distance away. Right. But we know that they're probably, they're, we know that they're closer. So, mm -hmm. Um, the way that that would work out is they would already, you know, they would already have the corrections built in to make it proportional to whatever distance they need with scale invariance. So these, yeah, these quote unquote meridian, speed. yeah, these quote unquote meridian corrections probably just like, that's probably exactly what it does. Yeah. So, uh, so there's actually a third correction. There's the, there's the onboard satellite atomic clock. Uh, velocity of this of the atomic clock correction there's the receiver uh there's the the range measurement equation at the receiver that shows the slide invariance respective to direction which must be due to drift but they say is due to earth rotation so they do a coordinate system rotation but then there would have to be a little bit left over because that based on you know ro rate of rotation at the ground it it couldn't match perfectly. It would have to be off slightly. So you're saying it must the little, little bit left over must be wrapped up in the meridian correction. Okay. Well, the reason I think this is important to like delineate this specifically is because, like, to invoke, to invoke like the problems, right? You know, it's it's easy to invoke the the problem of the onboard atomic clock desyncing, right? Like atomic clock shouldn't desync at all, right? right. That's that's like obvious and that's like the impossible for them to deal with. But I feel like talking about the second correction is like kind of more difficult to to invoke with any kind of convincingness to them because they're just going to say, well, here's what's going to happen. First, they're going to say it's just Earth rotation, and then you're going to point out, well, okay, that no, you're no you're, north south variance, you know that kind of stuff. Yeah, no north south invariance, but like technically to them, like they would not be like you wouldn't be able to claim mutual exclusivity like for east to west versus west to east not being earth rotation unless you could show that the specifically that the magnitude of it didn't match the fifteen degree per hour or whatever that it actually was off by a little bit even by doing that. And I don't know if we have the specifics like in any of these papers that shows that it's actually off. Well, we couldn't have we couldn't do it using GPS because it's a closed system and it's already got the corrections for that built in. But with right. interferometry, that's exactly what it shows, right? Like Yuri Galov showed that with his radio right. setup. So we, are, oh, it, it must needs be happening with the with the satellites, yeah. Yeah, we so just, it's okay. Yeah, so we have the mutual yeah. exclusivity over it not being rotation for sure. It's just like you have to well, break, yeah. you have to break it down to like to to that level. Yeah, well, I already know I mean, interferometry points to it, but I'm just like just evaluating satellites only in their own context of the satellites themselves, like. I'm not sure that we would be able to do that with the second correction. We can definitely, we can definitely yeah. pick apart the first one. Oh yeah. So the, yeah, the only way really would be no north south variance. You'd have to hammer that. 
yeah. there, would, there would have to be displacements and corrections made, even though... Yeah, because the Earth's still rotating out from under it. It doesn't matter what direction the signal's sending. The Earth's always rotating at the same rate, so... If it All happens right. to a bullet, it should happen to a light wave. 100%. Did, uh, that's that's actually crazy, too, to think about. That, like, they claim that it happens with bullets, but... <laughs> Not golf balls, basketballs, or paper airplanes. Yeah. <laughs> 